welcome to the KOps channel. I'm Rafael Lima, and today we're going to be talking about we're going to start talking about BDD and how to write API tests using BDD. Right. So first, I'm going to be talking about how we can uh, what is BDD and how can that be used in a project uh, in the way that it was meant to be used BDD. Uh, and later on, we're going to we're going to be using BDD to write the the scenarios and do the the auto, the whole API automation. And I'm going to show you step by step. Uh, also, oh, I just stopped talking about uh, I just talked about uh, Bash and Shell Script. We're going to be covering that a little bit more in advance in the future. But for now, I'm going to devote. Uh, into this new topic which is BDD right so talking about API tests and BDD right so the first thing that I want to divide is what is the what is REST API and what is BDD right so we have uh, we're going to be talking about REST API in a monolith monolith API uh, and a REST API in a microservice API And BDD, which is behavior-driven development. So those those two are two totally different things. We, I can have BDD uh, on a UI functional approach, and I also can have BDD using the API. I believe that the UI is a little bit easier to do BDD uh, when you're writing, thinking of, of the business and the requirement itself, because it's more close to how you interact with the application. While when you're using the API, we already we are already going to a technical details of endpoints and what kind of HTTP action are you doing? Are you doing get or post or delete? And what is the contract that you are sending? JSON, XML, whatever. So it's very easy. It's very easy to go into a specific of uh, the details, right? And that's. What the purpose of this presentation is to show how you should how should you use in a more efficient way related to the business, right? Right. So talking about REST API, we have in a monolith application we have the the REST API here is how uh, how you're going to be reached. You have the services. And you have the database here at the bottom, right? And this is how we're going to be how we're going to be accessed, right? So in this example, you you, you are able to access through the computer, uh, the uh, mobile device, and also through the TV, right? This, this is supposed to be a TV, right? So it's the beauty of the REST API is that you can have the same application being reached by any any kind of device right regardless if it's a mobile or not right if you have a mobile application it's going to use the it can use the rest api if that mobile application is using the website uh, it also is going to be using the 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 rest api and the same thing with the tv right so yeah when we go into the microservice era then we have the same thing right we have the the clients that's going to be reaching for the api we have the services that is going to do something and that service has a database the same the same as the monolith but now the service can request more data or request another service to process something and that service is going to have its own API. Like this service in this example, it has a service which has a, a REST API as well. Going a little bit further, now we have four services, right? Uh, in these services, I, I need to go to two other services to collect some information. I'm going to this one and to this one to collect some information in order to do something. This service does not have a DB database, but this one has a database, right? And this service has another dependency which requests another service data, right? And 
lastly this last service here also expose the API to the public right so although this one is using that that API as well this one also can be reached by the final user so this is a very simplistic way of looking at a microservice architecture uh, and I'm to only talking about here for services right you're going to be uh, in a place where you are using real microservice architecture you're going to be dealing with hundreds right? uh, where I work with at yeah, Transides we we have over 300 services I think and yeah so when we, you are dealing with a, a, a feature a full feature is going to be using exercising a lot of services not going to be only one you're going to uh, it's going to be it's going to be touching a lot of services in order to uh, in order to give that feature today right so now let's talk about the the ideal pyramid the, the, the ideal test pyramid right so everybody is already already uh, familiar with this test pyramid just a disclaimer this test is this test pyramid is it's kind of outdated uh, we don't we, we are not seeing any react testing any front-end unit testing we there is no contract testing here uh, and when we add unit uh, unit tests in the UI level with react for instance then it changed a lot the shape right but anyhow we have unit tests at the level, we have component test, uh, which is basically a test between multiple components, right? Uh, here you have integration test, then you can you can you can try to integrate multiple components, right? So when you're talking about here, I'm talking about these two. I have a model, let's say I have a, a, a method that I can try when I'm doing a component test. I can try to have uh, multiple. Let me refresh. I have a, a method that requires another method. Let's say to to process something. On a unit level, I'm going to be mocking the the method that I depend on. I'm going to be using a mock that say, hey, when I call this other method, just return an object. Or return no, whatever one wants to test. When I'm talking about component test, I'm talking about now I'm going to call that actual method. So I'm I'm calling two units, right? Two unit methods. When we go into the integration level, then um let's say I'm making the controller call my model or my DTO. So I'm I'm not constraint in that package like component I'm constrained into that component to that package and integration I'm I'm making one package call another so I have a controller calling another another area of my application right I could also have my uh, if you're talking about Ruby development uh, you can I can have a rails development sorry I can have my UI calling my controller right? great uh, of course, these are naming conventions. Uh, some people call integration tests more like a end-to-end -end approach. A functional test calling the real service that depends how 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 are using your component. API testing that's what we're going to be covered. Automated end-to-end -end test. When this period was created, I don't want to say that there was no microservice architecture, but if there were. Uh, it was still in the very beginning, right? But then my takeaway here is that when they wrote, when they created automated end-to-end -end tests, it's on a uh, it's on a monolith application. But even today, some teams like want, try to do end -to, uh, automated end-to-end -end tests, right? Which is hard. But anyhow, and then you have exploratory testing at the very at the very end, right? If we, we 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 talk about the shape of the pyramid, we have more isolation here, as I, I as I describe, because you're testing a unit, or you're testing, uh, you are mocking another dependencies, or or even when you're not mocking, you're still constrained there, and you are faster, and therefore you are cheaper as well, because it's faster to create, it's faster to run. 
as I go up the pyramid then it becomes slower because it becomes more integrated so I have more services or I have more stuff happening there then it becomes more expensive because I have to deal with more things uh, even data now and then I it's going to take more time to create take more time to execute take more take more time to troubleshoot so that's why this is more expensive right we're going to be covering this specific part here right so types of tests right so what what can I do in the API level I can do functional test uh, there is a typo I missed the T sorry I can do functional test I can do acceptance test which is the user flow right now uh, in the user flow uh, if I if I have an e-commerce one I would do the the user flow of the user being registered the user would register the test would register a user would create a user would log in with the user and would try to purchase purchase something right? the functional test would just one test would create the user another test would log in another test would try to there would be no flow then I have sanity test, right? Which, which is testing just my the sanity of my application, which is uh, the bare minimum that I can say, okay, this this build this artifact, artifact looks good enough. Uh, I can try and go further into my testing, and that would be like in my user flow. Let's say I could have a a acceptance test, a, a sanity test doing my user flow, which would be as I said, register user, log in, and try to purchase. Because if I have a e-commerce, and if the user cannot register, that means I cannot onboard new user. If the user cannot log in, I cannot give access to my already my already uh, registered user access to the system. And if I cannot, if the user cannot purchase something, make make a purchase, then I cannot make money. So if you cannot do the basic things of your system, does it, does it make sense to, to you to go further into your test and do your regression, do any of the fancy stuff if the user cannot do the basics? So that's the sanity. You have contract test, which is checking the contract itself of, 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 the, of the API, right? It's not checking the functionality, it's not a functional test is checking if the contract are the same right? are, as, as you expect if I'm saying uh, I need to send you a name in my in the name the value of the name it's a name in string a string value then I cannot send you name in Spanish or name in, in, in Portuguese which would be nomi right I cannot I cannot do that right I cannot say name in Portuguese is Nomi the only thing that I'm changing here the only thing that I'm changing here is the O for the A right it's a very simple change but the system doesn't know so if the system is expecting name and I give the system Nomi it's going to be it's not going to be able to parse because it's not going to understand the O right it's, it's expecting an A there the same thing with the value itself if I expect the, the value of this field to be a string and I send an integer, it's going to fail. So contract tests are checking those, that specific contract, right? If the communication is happening. And then I have the endpoints end health check. So in a Microsoft architecture, if you're talking about Kubernetes, you have also ways of checking uh, if the system is responding or not, if the system is just alive or not. But if we're talking about endpoints here, uh, that depends on, on the, and how you, you're building, which technology you're building. But if you're using Spring Boot, Spring Boot, and Spring Boot has endpoints to check if the system is responding or not. And then you have the endpoints to check if the endpoints are responding or not. So the health check of the endpoints would be you try to hit an endpoint. Uh, it's not going to be a functional test because you're not actually sending real stuff there, or, or by real I mean useful stuff. 
you're going to be sending the minimal thing for the end the endpoint to return. If you expect that endpoint to return 200, doesn't really matter the outcome. You just want to check if it's responding 200, and then you're going to check all of your endpoints are responding. And the reason for that is does also does not make much sense for you to do any any other kind of testing if your hand endpoints are not responding the basics which is 200 if your endpoints not responding 200 then that endpoint is not healthy the system might not be healthy as well so that's up to you to decide what kind of level you want to do great so how can we divide we have all of those kind of tests and how can i do that in a way that makes sense for the team and I have, I'm going to have a fast feedback for my team. Then you're going to have a pipeline. You're going to do a pipeline. You're going to build on CircleCI. You're going to build on Jenkins. You're going to build on Travis, Travis CI. There are so many, many options today and you can choose one, whatever it's best for you. <laughs> so based on what I just described, um, I put the first one as the health check because if my system is not responding to the minimum uh, of a request, then there is no point of doing anything else. Then I'll check the sanity, which is the most basic things that my system needs to do. What is the most basic or what, what are the most basic features that my system needs to do in order for me to say, okay, this is enough, I can, I can move forward. Now I have acceptance, which would be my user flows. I have various user, user flows, and I can do those user flows as well. Now I can do my functional tests, would be my, the whole regression of, of, of what I have, or everything that I want to test in a functional level. I'm not, I'm not doing user flows, all right? I'm testing the specific functionality. Right? And I have contract, which is checking my contract as well. Uh, some teams rather do contract before than others. That that's going to depend. I have also a typo here. I forgot the T. Uh, the contract uh, before because in their heads, uh, if the contract is not okay, if the communication is not happening, then there is no point of going further because the whole process is broken. That makes sense as well. So it's up to the team to decide what what makes sense for the team. So I have here a, a quick diagram to talk about contract testing, right? So uh, there is a book by Sam Newman called uh, micro, Building Microservices that talks about how you test on a microservice architecture and the, the, the role of a contract test, right? But in this case, I have four services that has different testing strategies. You can see that service A has the ideal test pyramid, service B has the the anti pattern which is the which is the ice cone you have the cupcake which is before between b and a uh, the shape you're going to have a cupcake you have a square so you're going to have different different you, in your services you're going to have different test strategy different teams are dealing with that but in order to guarantee the communication between those is the contract test that comes in play Right. And in the book, Sam Neiman says that you, if you have contract tests, if you can guarantee that the communication is happening between services, you don't actually need full end-to-end -end testing to, to make sure that they are okay because each service are testing, they have their own test, test strategy and the contract would serve as the integration part between services, right? And that, that's a very interesting approach because doing full end-to-end -end in a microservice architecture that's very time consuming you, you're going to have a reliable test environment it's a lot of hassle to deal with it and in this approach you can isolate a service and then do contract testing to make sure the communication is happening there are other ways you can use grpc you can one service can provide a library so you don't have to deal with contract tests but if that service provides a library now you're going to have to do extra testing on that library so there are, there are various approach of guaranteeing the contract or guarantee actually the communication but that's very important that's it that's a very important thing to do which is to guarantee the communication between services 
because you don't want to rely on full end-to-end -end tests on a microservice architecture to make sure that the communication is happening. So this is, that's it for now. I'm, uh, we just talked about API testing and how you can have a, a roughly pipeline, a rough pipeline between those to make sure that uh, between those tests, uh, for those tests, so we can you can have a fast feedback because the important approach here, not to forget, is one, if my sanity breaks, my pipeline is going to be broken here. I'm not going to go further because there is no point. The user cannot buy it, so there is no point for me to check in anything else in that build if the user cannot buy or if the user cannot log in, right? So the same thing here, if the, health, if the endpoints are not responding, there is no point of me doing any of those other tests because the endpoint is not responding, right? So the pipeline, the, it's made for you to have different jobs so you can have fast feedback and that's how you can divide it, your your API into multiple tests as well that depends on what what is important for you because if you wait everything to run in one single job once it fails you don't actually know what actually failed just by the job that failed you're going to have to look into the logs but not only that you're going to also have to deal with uh, you're going to have two ways. Let's say that from here to here, it took 20 minutes. It's not that long, right? But let's say it failed here. You're going to have to wait everything to be ran for you to figure out that it failed here, right? It failed in, in, in the most basic feature. feature. If you divide it into jobs, in five minutes, you already know if it's broken or not. So the team or the developer did not have to wait 20 minutes. They only had to wait five. So that's a fast feedback approach. And that's the, 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 the real beauty of a pipeline. Right? So thank you for watching. Uh, next video, we're going to be talking about BDD, very specific on how you can write BDD for the business. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And thank you for watching.